Greetings and welcome to episode 6 of R. Kelly Appeal TV. Today is November 28th, 2021 and we are live in the studio at Scales to Success LLC where we are here keeping you linked and updated on upcoming appeal information regarding the legendary R&B singer Robert Sylvester Kelly and his appeal journey. I'm Shine Wisdom, your host, and I welcome you. A shout out to instrumusic.com for providing us with the background instrumental for this episode. So in episode five last week, we left off with two questions that I'm going to incorporate into our theme of today's segment, and the questions are as follows. Can R. Kelly's case be overturned based on witnesses' perjured testimony under oath now that he has been found guilty on all charges? Number two, would R. Kelly be in this moral situation if he wasn't who Hollywood made him out to be through the popularity process? Number three, is R. Kelly the only one who should stand accused for the entertainment downfall that overtook his life? These are very valuable questions to an appeal process as far as I'm concerned because there are a lot of moral uh, fabric that should be woven into the decision regarding an appeal. So let's get right into the segment. Can R. Kelly's case be overturned based on witness perjured testimony? Under oath, now that he has been found guilty on all charges. Well, according to Global News, a secondary source stating the case is being re-reviewed regarding the concept of perjured testimony, Kelly's defense attorney at the time, Stephen Greenberg, called out Michael Avenatti, stating that Avenatti represented two of the people in the R. Kelly case. It was later noted that he, Avenatti, represented all the women in docu-series. Greenberg stated that Avenatti had some vendetta against Kelly, that Avenatti practiced law unauthorized in Illinois, um, said another source. Now, Greenberg stated that, quote, the cases were rejected 15 years ago within his 30-year as within his 30 year experience as a defense lawyer, he had never seen cases reopened due to a public perception change. It is unheard of to reopen closed cases from years ago, end quote. The link to this video is in the description box for your viewing. These are some very strong points that are being made here. Another point shared that um, reflected that the Kelly appeal was about the DNA processing analysis within rape kids. Within 24 hours after a rape has taken place, there needs to be some DNA that uh, would be analyzed to determine if the individual actually did the rape. There were no kids to be analyzed, resubmitted. There were no new evidence that these uh, allegations of rape had actually taken place. These women also perjured themselves on how they wrote letters acknowledging things that they had taken from R. Kelly. And years later, they stated that these signed letters were written under duress. How does this hold up in court? It's not quite hearsay, but very similar. Let me know what you think. Now, hearsay in the court of law is defined as the report of another person's words by a witness, which is unusually disallowed as evidence in a court of law. What happens when that person is the witness and states that these that that they've lied under, you know, um, one set of circumstances? and they're expected to be believed in a court of law. Their signatures were signed. 
they were saying that they were in relationships with R. Kelly. They were seen being happy with him. And then when the perception, public perception changed, everyone turned all good intentions or whatever their will was at the time into something heinous. This is just the thought. The fact that the individual cannot prove other than the word of mouth makes what they say null and void when they are found to have perjured themselves in any criminal case, civil case. And let's look up the definition of perjury. Now, according to Google, I'm going to get two sources here. According to Google, which is kind of a, a primary source, but we'll call it a secondary source here. According to Google, the offense of willfully telling an untruth in a court after having taken an oath or affirmation is the definition of perjury. Now let's get to a primary source. According to the Department of Justice, under code 1745, perjury in a federal proceeding under oath is defined as, this is one element. The first element of perjury offense is that the defendant must be under oath during his testimony, declaration or certification unless the perjurist statement is an unsworn declaration permitted by United States Code 1746-28. No specific form of oath is required. The oath must only be sufficiently clear that the declaration is aware that he or she or the declarant is aware that she or he is under oath and required to speak the truth. Proof of the competency and authority of the oath giver may be required for prosecutions under section 1621. More on this research can be found here at the link um, in the description box below. So we're gonna go a little bit deeper. What are the three elements of perjury? Number one, the element of perjury is that the declarant tool, um, the declarant took an oath to to testify truthfully. So they know what the truth is. And when it's material, it has to be sufficient to what has taken place over time. And I believe that the element of this case right here with R. Kelly defined all the women saying the same thing over and over and over without having known them could have been one of the elements that they possibly consider. Now, number two, that he willfully made a false statement contrary to that of an oath. So that's another element of perjury, that a person willfully makes a false statement contrary to that of an oath. So that's another question where um, Joshua Savage may say, I'm happily in love with, you know, R. Kelly, quote, as a living girlfriend and on the Gail King show. And then when the docuseries comes out, now she has been a sex slave that has been, you know, took over state lines and gagged and, you know, were made to wear these you know, baggy clothes and all this other stuff. And number three, that the declarant believes that the statement is untrue. Um, <laughs> that the declarant believes the statement to be untrue. So I don't know how that plays in as an element, but number four, that the statement related to a material fact. And that's the part where I don't understand. How can someone look at this, these statements and relate them to material facts? There's nothing holding them in abeyance right now to the statement that they're stating happened so many years ago. So these are some serious facts of why I feel an appeal can be held um, strongly, strongly can be held in favor of, you know, um, just perjury in and, of, in and of itself. And then the declaration also of um, the rules set forth in um, the willfully 
telling of an untruth and then having evidence to show that at one point they stated it was untrue. So these are just a few areas. So you let me know what you think about um, what this means to you. So let's go into question number two. Would R. Kelly be in this moral situation if he wasn't who Hollywood made him out to be through pop popular process? I talked to many people this week and I found that some people, the poll went as follows. <laughs> All money is not good money, as we can see in the case of R. Kelly throughout his career. And some state that if R. Kelly was a basic Joe on the street today, would he be enduring this misfortune? Well, what do you think? Someone told me to go back to the song Fame by Irene Cara, 1983. And these are, I don't remember everything, but I remember, um, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to learn how to fly. I feel it coming together. People will see me and cry fame. I'm going to make it to heaven, light up the sky like a flame. I'm going to live forever. Someone will remember my name. I can't remember the rest, but possibly still singing on the subway for rent money. I believe that R. Kelly will still be the man of fame that he actually became in the end anyway. If he independently kept believing in himself, in himself, then I think that would have created a different format to who he had, who he is now. But the point is that I really believe that R. Kelly became famous due to his stardom with popular gurus in the music industry who saw how they could manipulate and make fame off of his talents. Getting there quicker is not the overall goal of success. People from his initial stardom were everyday individuals. They are everyday individuals now where he resides at the moment. But the money came when he chose to believe in people outside of who he was. Thus, possibly creating this power of jealousy that others conspired against that caused his fall. Regardless of the fact that his name remained his own or did his name remain his own. R. Kelly was a pseudonym for Robert Sylvester Kelly, and that's what I found this week when questioned on number two. Would R. Kelly be in this moral situation if he wasn't who Hollywood made him out to be through popularity process? Now moving on to three. Question number three and final. Is R. Kelly the only one who should stand accused for the entertainment downfall that overtook his life? Well, let's look at some factors here. The outcome that millions enveloped and embraced during the height of his success may have created an egoic personality that would have otherwise not been created. So let's look deeper. Psychologically, if we look at the mental states of responsibility in any measure of a situation, one would suggest that one must already be moral and ready and prepared for what life is about to bring them, especially when focusing on superstardom. One individual made it very clear, not even parents are given a blue book to parenting. So do you believe all parents should just know what basic rules come with parenting? Why should it become any different with the moral responsibility of a millionaire star who makes money doing what he or she is known for doing in the spotlight of millions to become a direct moral and ethical mentor to all their fans? Now in a just and moral society, that would be absolutely the way it should be. This thought made sense at the time. However, it is the responsibility of those who are given the ability to touch millions to at least think of those who are hearing and seeing the lives being shown through the eyes of a superstar performer. It is up to the individual to have a unique 
way of looking at why we like our superstars, why we choose that this person is, should be, you know, uh, known to millions. And before people become these superstars, their weaknesses need to be identified so that they will in turn know how to handle the weaknesses of their personality and their character. But many people are not focused on that because it's all about the almighty dollar. So what do you think about the moral obligation of performers to become mentors to their fans? I mean, do they have the eyes of millions on them at one time right at their fingertips? We understand that part. But are they encompassing who they really are enough to create millions of those fans and stars that believe in their belief system? If we go all the way back to the 90s with R. Kelly, would we now, knowing what we know today, allow certain things to take place um, as we know them to be right now. And this is where the, the ex-defense uh, attorney was talking that when the public's eye or the public's perception changes, are we going to be allowed to go back in the criminal justice system and pull things that was okay at one point to the point where now a person can be charged, well, back then a person can be charged and released and said, no, you know, this is not, we're, we're not going to uphold this in a court of law. And then 20, 15, 10 years later, something comes up, will they be able to say in a court of law that we can go back and reopen a case and charge what should have been charged years later. That's a very scary um, diagnosis when we look at the criminal justice system, um, especially with the fact that among our peers, our jurors are never our peers. Never are they our peers. Um, please like, comment, and share this podcast as we are growing within the research of the Kelly Appeal and its process. We're trying to find many ideas and conversations that can be a cause of appeal action or to possibly have the case of our appeal, R. Kelly appealed and overturned. Thank, thank you so much for your comments. And, you know, sometimes being on this podcast is all about, you know, um, trying to say the right words to make sense to help assist one in some ideas that could be brought up. Um, so sometimes we may ramble, sometimes we, we may, you know, make our mistakes, but I do not believe in editing. I believe that this is how it should be, you know, coming out. And so with that, I thank you so, so much. Um, keep it 100 always, and we will see you next time.